Today's reading is taken from 1 Peter 3, verses 8 to 18. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. But he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Hello, Avenue. Uh, it's good to be able to preach today. We we'll be able to see you today. Wish we could do this in person still. But we're going to carry on looking at this letter of 1 Peter that we've been looking at for the last couple of months. Uh, we're going to jump straight into it now. Um, so it'd be great if you have the bit of the Bible that we just have read to us open in front of us, verses 8 to 18 of chapter 3. Because it all flows together, they're not taken in isolation, this is a bit that flows from the bits before it. And in the last few sections of 1 Peter we've looked at, Peter's been instructing the churches he's writing to on how they should live in the world that they're in. So back in chapter 2, he urged his readers, as a result of all of the truth that he's reminded them of in the first one and a bit chapters, to fight all the sinful desires they might have and instead live good, godly lives in the pagan societies that they found themselves in. And he began by telling them how to do that in the way they submit to earthly authorities and rulers. And he then moved on to telling slaves how to do that in their workplaces. And then last week we saw how at the start of chapter three, he speaks to wives and husbands about how they should live as Christians. And for each of those people, slaves, citizens, wives, husbands, Peter was pointing to the ultimate example of Jesus's submission and love and endurance as a model for them to follow. I mean, how they're going to follow it is going to look slightly different from person to person and role to role and situation to situation. But ultimately, following it isn't just one option these people have. No, that is what Christians are called to do. And in the section we're looking at today, Peter now addresses all Christians that he's writing to. Anyone who reads it, whether they're husbands, wives, slaves or not. He starts in our section today. Finally, all of you. What he's about to say is to every Christian reading this letter. And in the verses that follow, I think he tells us to do three main things. Firstly, he says, be united. Secondly, return evil with blessing. And third, revere Christ as Lord. So firstly, Peter tells Christians to be united. Peter carries on his instructions by telling Christians that the way they should live with each other in their local communities is to be united. Finally, all of you, all of you, whenever Christians and wherever you interact with each other and wherever you spend time together, this is the way you should be. Like-minded, sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. This is the way that Christians are meant to be with each other. And let's be honest, we could spend weeks unpacking this verse. Well, I could spend weeks unpacking this verse. There's so much here that we could spend all of this on one verse alone today, but we don't have all of today. So we're going to do a quick whistle stop tour of it. And here we see that Peter tells Christians we're meant to be like minded. Now, that doesn't mean we all think the same things about different situations. No, there's space for differences and disagreements and all sorts of issues. But what this does mean is that we must have the same main goal as each other. And that aim should be serving God and loving one another. So obeying God, serving him and loving each other must be all of our primary aim. That means that we can't be driven by any selfish interests or desires. Our specific callings or ministries or area of service, they are important, yeah. But they mustn't be so important 
that focusing on them stops us obeying God and loving our brothers and sisters in our church family. We are to be like-minded. But we're also to be sympathetic. To be sympathetic. Now this might feel like a, a difficult command. How can Peter command us to feel something? Sympathy is an emotion, isn't it? Well, yes, it can be. But what Peter's getting at is that we should be living so closely with each other that when one person hurts, we hurt. When one person mourns, we mourn. He's saying we should be relating with each other so closely that when something happens to others, it feels like it happens to us because we're so closely tied with them in the way we live together. We are to be sympathetic. But we're also to love one another. And again, this isn't just an emotion. This isn't a nice lovey-dovey feeling. This is talking about brotherly love, meaning close family love. I don't know what your family relationships have been like with your siblings, if you even had them. But I imagine they weren't wonderful and they weren't great. Well, this is not talking about that sort of brotherly love. This is saying that in an ideal Christian community, it should produce between people who are not linked by blood the same level of affection as good, close, caring brothers, caring for each other, watching out for each other, correcting errors in each other, warning against dangerous behaviours, having fun together, protecting each other, providing for each other when we're in need. Peter says we are to love one another and we're to be compassionate. We're to be compassionate. That means we're to show loving consideration for each other and to not ignore people who are struggling. So if we see someone having a hard time, maybe on Zoom or Facebook or wherever, we can't ignore them. We just can't ignore people struggling. We have to contact them. We've got to reach out. Yeah, that's made all the more difficult at the moment, but that doesn't mean that we can sack this off. It just means we have to work harder at it and it can make the world a difference. We're to be more deliberate in doing this. Back near the start of the pandemic in March, on one of the YouTube sermons, I said how I'd been struggling with it all and finding it particularly difficult for a, for a whole host of reasons. So I was really touched when, I think it was maybe the day after, someone from the church family texted me to check how I was doing on the back of it. That's compassion. It's feelings of concern for someone that's shown through action. And so with each other, we're to be compassionate. But we're also to be humble. We're to be humble. Humble people are those people who are following Jesus' example as well. Perhaps best described by the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, where he says that even though Jesus was completely God, he didn't demand to be treated like it. Instead, he humbled himself and put the needs of others ahead of his own, going so far as to die on the cross for our needs. And so Paul says, in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. We're to put others first. We're to consider others as more important than us. That's what Jesus did, and that's the example that he left for us. We, as a church family, are to be humble. We're to be like-minded, sympathetic, loving one another like a family, being compassionate and humble. That, that's our calling as a church. But that's tough, isn't it? For a whole host of reasons, not just the distance created by the pandemic. I mean, this means willingly putting our own independence and our own time to ourselves to one side. And it means choosing to live in close community with people who, quite frankly, might do our head in. Which is a huge challenge, especially in today's culture. But this is how we live out our identity as the chosen people of God, as a royal priesthood, as a holy nation, as God's special possession. So how close are we to our other members of our church family? How involved do we get in our church? Do we keep ourselves distant and busy elsewhere or do we sacrificially invest in and love others in our church? You see the truth is there's no way to read through the New Testament and honestly conclude that wholehearted investment in the local church family is an option that we have. No it's what we do. It's what Christians do. Now this gets harder in a church as it gets bigger and bigger. And as Avenue Church, it's probably not practical to be living in that close level of community and intimacy with 100 plus others, even in normal times, let alone during a pandemic. But 
that's why we have home groups. That's why we think home groups and things like prayer triplets are just desperately important. That's why reading the Bible with people one to one is so important. That's part of the way that we can do all of these things better. So how is our commitment and our involvement to things like home groups and family meetings and prayer triplets? If we're not in one, ask, find one, let's get in one, get stuck in. We'd love to hook you up with a home group if you're not in one already. Because that is where we can do the one anothering, like this sort of thing, better. Those places are the best places that currently we can do all of these things that we're called to do. That is the way that we, as a local church, can be united. Which is what Peter says we're called to do. But he then moves on to tell us how we should act towards people who aren't Christians and that really seems to be the reason he's writing to these churches in the first place. They seem to be currently experiencing attack from the world around them that little do they know is only just going to get worse. But those attacks, he's telling them, are not an excuse to act differently or to ignore their call to a different type of living. And so he tells them that secondly, they need to return evil with blessing. Have a look at verse 9. Do not repay evil with insult. Sorry. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. He tells us that when we're attacked and called names or overlooked at work or mocked and or humiliated, especially due to what we believe, as Christians, we're not to retaliate. But that doesn't mean we just remain neutral either. We're not to be spiritual Switzerlands. Instead, as followers of Jesus, we are to repay evil, whatever that might look like, with blessing. Well, what does he mean by blessing? I think there's a whole range of things this could be, and I'm sure you could think creatively of all sorts of reasons and, uh, and things it might be. But ultimately, blessing those who persecute us means praying for them and looking for every opportunity possible to share the gospel with them, no matter how intense the persecution they give us is. I mean, this, this kind of reaction to persecution, particularly in extreme circumstances, is a distinctly Christian reaction, and it is, it's extraordinary. Richard Wormbrand was a pastor in Romania during communism, and during that time, biblical Christianity was illegal, and anyone found practice in it was imprisoned, tortured, and often executed. And he wrote about it in the incredible book, that makes it sound more happy than it is, but Tortured for Christ which is a really intense read, but in it he says this. I've seen Christians in communist prisons with 50 pounds of chains on their feet, tortured with red hot iron pokers, in whose throats spoonfuls of salt have been forced, being kept afterwards without water, starving, whipped, suffering from cold, and praying with fervour for the communists. This is humanly inexplicable. It is the love of Christ which was poured out in our hearts. A little later in the book, he tells this story. A minister who'd been horribly beaten was thrown into my cell. He was half dead, with blood streaming from his face and body. We washed him. Some prisoners cursed the communists. Groaning, he said, Please, don't curse them. Keep silent. I wish to pray for them. In the book, he talks about unimaginable cruelty towards Christians purely because of their faith. But he also talks about unimaginable love and blessing from Christians towards people doing those evil things. And this can only come from people who are certain that their heavenly home and reward from God is far greater than any pleasure or comfort they can get on earth. We can do this only because we know through faith that, that no matter what it might cost us in this life, we have a far greater blessing and reward from God reserved for us in heaven. That's the inheritance that Peter reminded us of back in chapter 1. And the fellowship with him, no matter what trials we go through now. That's why Peter then quotes Psalm 34 in this chapter. It's reminding us that people who have the Lord's blessing will be people who seek to bless others, even our enemies. Now, to be clear, this, this isn't a do good so you receive a blessing. Instead, it's a because you know you are promised a blessing, always bless others. So to put it another way, Christians demonstrate our faith that we will receive an eternal blessing from God 
in the way we refuse to retaliate and kick off when we get persecuted for what we believe and how we behave as a result of what we believe. And then by how we bless those who are attacking us. So if and when we are attacked for what we believe or how we live out what we believe, how are we to react? Do we attack? Do we get angry? Do we retaliate? The truth is our response to whatever level of persecution we get demonstrates how much we believe the gospel promises reserved for us. And this challenges me. I mean, how often when faced with sacrifice and suffering, whether directly because I'm a Christian or not, how often is a promise of eternity a comfort to me? How often is the prize that Christ has won for us, this inheritance he had gained for us, how often is that something that brings me comfort and something that helps me to love people who mock me or who stand against what I believe? I mean, the truth is we live in a time and place in the UK when, despite maybe a bit of ridicule for seeming outdated or perhaps being called a bigot or something, we face very little persecution at the moment. I mean, that, that might change, it might not. We don't know the future. But that doesn't mean we're let off the hook. Now, our call as Christians, in all circumstances, is to be so convinced of the future blessing we have guaranteed for us in Christ Jesus that any other suffering doesn't even compare to it. That's how the Apostle Paul says it in Romans 8. I consider that our present sufferings are not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's why Peter says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. You're still guaranteed this future blessing from God. And that should be a comfort. And so he tells us, quoting from Isaiah 8 verse 12, do not fear their threats. If you look at your footnotes, it might say, meaning don't fear what non-Christians fear. Do not be frightened. You see, the thing that this world fears the most is death. How much have we seen that during the pandemic? But they fear it because they're convinced that's the end. But as Christians, we know better, don't we? We know that isn't the end of the story. See, we know as Christians, the best for us is yet to come. And so the reason we cannot fear their threats and we cannot fear what they th fear is seen in the final thing that Peter tells Christians to do. Thirdly, he says, revere Christ as Lord. Verse 15, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That is, that is how we can do all of the stuff he's written about so far. This is how we can submit ourselves to ungodly, unfair rulers and rules. This is how slaves can submit to masters, even when they're unjust. This is how wives can love and submit to husbands, even if they're not Christians and loving them properly. This is how husbands can love their wives in a Christ-like way. This is how we, as a local church, can be like-minded, sympathetic, loving, compassionate and humble with each other, even when we annoy each other. And this is how we can bless those who persecute us, because we revere Jesus as Lord. Now to revere Christ as Lord is it's kind of a weird word we don't really use revere very much but it means here to choose and to believe and remember that Jesus not any human not any other circumstance is truly Lord over every single circumstance of our lives. It means that we keep focusing on that deep confidence we have that Jesus is still reigning as Lord and is still king over all. And who even now has angels, authorities and powers subject to him, as Peter's going to say in verse 22. No matter what else happens to us. But the problem is that's, that's relatively easy to agree with and even agree that that's what the Bible teaches. But in reality... That's pretty hard to live out and to remember day to day, isn't it? It's so easy to forget or disbelieve the, that the true Christ as Lord perspective on things. It's so easy to forget that with a virus seemingly running amok in the world, that Jesus Christ is still Lord and is still ruling and is still in charge. It's so easy to forget that when the diagnosis is given or when the marital difficulties hit or the children refuse to believe or we lose our jobs, or when things just don't go the way we'd hoped and planned in our lives, whatever that might look like. It's so easy to forget that Jesus Christ is still Lord and he's still good and we're still blessed. But that's why we need to be people who are stuck into God's word. We need to be reading our Bibles. 
When you read your Bible, it shows us again and again the complete authority and faithfulness and goodness of our God and Saviour in all manner of circumstances. It gives us a much bigger view of God and it helps us keep the situations we face every day in perspective. And it also reminds us more and more of that future blessing that we have promised for us to help us fix our hope and our attention and our focus on. But this again, and I've said this a lot during the One Peter series, but this is again why we need each other. That's why you watching this need us as a church. And this is why we need you. This is why we need to be stuck into God's word on our own and together so that we can keep reminding each other of the right perspective on things. Doing all the things that we're usually encouraging each other to do helps us keep perspective on who Jesus Christ was, is and will forever be the Lord of all. When we forget that, or we're tempted to doubt it and take things into our own hands, we need that reminding. I need you to remind me when I'm discouraged. We need each other. And you don't have to be the most mature Christian in the room to be able to be an encouragement to someone else. We just need to revere Christ as Lord and encourage others to do that too. Not perfectly, we're not expecting that. The Bible never demands that but to believe it wholeheartedly and encourage others to believe it too. And doing that means that we will always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks for the hope that we have. See, the reason we have hope is because no matter what else happens, Jesus is still Lord. And he's not a Lord like the world thinks, bossing people around, never getting his own hands dirty. Now, our Lord demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he died for us. So we can trust him now, no matter what. You see, the reason we have hope is because of the gospel. So how often does the fact that in Christ God has forgiven your sins thrill you? How much is that a cause of worship and wonder? How does the fact that instead of being far away from God, separated from him forever, which we deserve, we're brought near into his family, into his people, into his priesthood. How, much, how real is that to us? How much of a cause for hope is that for us? Peter expects it to be a huge comfort and source of hope for us. That's really difficult at the moment. One of the ways we love to encourage each other is by singing to and with each other. And we can't do that at the moment. So we have to work extra hard at doing it in other ways. They're trying our best to do it on Zoom, whether that's at home group or the 11am Zooms that we have on a Sunday morning. Midweek, chatting with people, ringing people, texting people. We've got to work harder at doing this to keep each other going, to keep our hope levels up. And this will be a huge comfort and a source of hope for us. So much so that our refusal to repay evil with evil will cause people to ask us why. Maybe not immediately, but it will. This is similar to something Peter said back in chapter 2, verse 12. You see... Our different way of living, of not retaliating when we're attacked, our desire to live in a special intimacy and unity with the other people of God will make people want to know why. Jesus says it time and again through the Gospels as well, and so they'll ask. And we need to know the answer, and our answer is the Gospel. So we need to revere Christ as Lord in our hearts to help us keep living well when we're attacked and to help us know what to say when we're asked why we keep living well. But Peter carries on. He tells us to do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Guys, we've got no excuse for being rude. Ever. I think Richard's said this before, but Glenn Scrivener, the evangelist, he has a rule for Christians on social media he wishes they all followed. Say you're a Christian in your biography and then don't be a jerk. Simple, right? But... How easy is it to be grumpy or rude or short-tempered or even aggressive when we feel wronged, even if it's not for what we believe? Like, that stereotype of a grumpy older Christian is a stereotype for a reason. It's so easy to fall into being grumpy or aggressive or whatever. Just ask me when I'm driving and someone cuts me up. But Peter says, if we're any of those things and we suffer for that, well, we've only got ourselves to blame. Instead, as Christians, we should be gentle and full of respect for others. I mean, that's what our saviour did, isn't it? When they abused him, he never retaliated. When they tried to stone him, he didn't attack. When they arrested him to kill him, he healed instead of running. 
when they spat in his face and ripped out his beard and beat him with sticks, he never raged against them. When they whipped him close to the point of death, he wasn't swearing, he was never rude. When he was falsely accused of all sorts, he remained gentle and respectful. When he was talking to Pilate about to be sentenced to death, he behaved properly. When they took him up that hill and nailed him to the cross, he didn't scream or shout. Instead, he prayed for those people who were killing him. And when he took your and my sins in himself, in his body on the cross, and suffered the full wrath of God in our place, he kept his eyes on the joy, the blessing that he had set before him. And he won for us eternal forgiveness, salvation and blessing. You see, that is our example. That is our saviour. We don't follow a saviour who considered equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, our saviour humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. And we follow him. And he did all of that to unite us to him and each other, particularly in a local church. So we are, if we're to be following him, we are to be united. We're to have the same purpose of serving him and loving each other and helping each other serve him and love each other. We're to repay evil with blessing, no matter the cost. And we do that by revering Christ as Lord over all things and wanting to honour him more than we want anything else. Because that will be the best witness we have as individuals and as a local church to the real hope that we have our only hope in life and death. Let's be praying this week in your triplets, in your home groups, on your own, in your families. Let's be praying that we would do this more and more for and with each other. Mm -hmm.